All right, class, sit sit on <laughs> sit on down. It's time for Weeb Academy, or whatever it is I'm going to call this little series, where uh, whenever I feel like I'm going to have an hour ish of free time, uh, we're going to sit on down, uh, get on down, and give you some hot information on Weeb related stuff. Okay, so today's lecture is Final Fantasy. Guidance, uh, Final Fantasy spinoffs. Okay, so today we're just going to be doing the first, uh, the first uh, uh, decade of them. So from 1990 up to 2000. And the reason I put the cutoff there is because 2001, uh, I believe, marks the release of Final Fantasy Spirits Within, and that's a whole nother complicated uh, situation. And uh, that also implies that I have to talk about Kingdom Hearts, and that's a, a thing within itself. And you know what? We're just not going there. We're not going to talk about Evil East Alliance, okay? We're just going from 1990 to 2000. All right? Okay, great. Let's uh, let's hop on in. Uh, some of you may be asking yourself, hey, uh, uh, where's the regular numbered Final Fantasy uh, lecture? Where's that? Uh, someone else actually did it, and it's actually pretty cool. Um, but... Uh, frankly, if I'm going to be real with you, as much as I love the idea of walking up on stage and doing this because I actually wanted to be a teacher, um, if I hear the story about, hmm, well, they thought the game was going to be their final game and it was going to be a fantasy title, uh, they named it fi I'm literally going to rip my own fucking ass off. I swear to God, I will literally rip my own butt off and eat it if I have to hear that one more time. So anyway... Let's uh let's get started with the real stuff, the real story you don't know unless if you do, uh the Saga games. Now, uh you may be thinking, wait a minute, those aren't Final Fantasy games. Uh you know that's half true because uh in the states, uh, all three of the Saga Game Boy trilogy games, uh were titled Final Fantasy Legend. And while they weren't Final Fantasy games in the truest sense, they had a lot of the same staff that worked on Final Fantasy games. Uh, as a lot of you almost certainly know, Final Fantasy 2 is a very strange beast. Uh, you know, it had the whole backwards uh, uh, hit yourself to gain experience people love to meme on. Uh, but Final Fantasy 2 has a whole lot of other uh, just really backwards mechanics to it that are just just bad and uh, a square, uh, a young square, uh, realized, hmm, this director, uh, whose name is, mm, I shouldn't forget the man's name, that's very rude of me, um, uh, Kawazu, I believe, uh, Kawazu, who directed Final Fantasy 2, and would later on, uh, I believe, take up the helm for Final Fantasy 12. Uh, Square knew this guy is a pretty interesting dude. He has some very interesting video game ideas. And his games are always interesting, but they're very rarely good. And that's because none of them are intuitive. And a little game called uh, 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 Makai Toshi Saga, uh, as it's normally translated, a uh, Warrior in the Spirit Tower Saga, which always seemed weird because the, the Makai they use seem to be the same one for, like, Demon Realm, even though Spirit, you know realm is technically correct too uh it's no exception so after directing final fantasy 2 and realizing this guy knows what's up but i don't know how profitable he is uh, uh they basically uh, uh led him into directing the saga series they put a big bundle of bucks uh underneath a stick uh with a box and he just took the bait and that's how we got the saga games so the first three are all um basically three of the best Game Boy games on that system. Uh, for the Game Boy's first year, uh, <laughs> uh, the Final Fantasy Legend was probably the best game on that bad boy. Uh, and here's, here's the deal. I'll give you the lowdown, right? Uh, you are a group of mercenaries, and you're out here trying to climb the big tower. And at the top, you'll get a wish. Who knows what's up there? It could be anything. And uh, uh, each floor of the tower is actually a sort of sub-reality. It's like, it's its its, its own little contained world. And uh, each one of these worlds has some type of fun theme to it, with uh, some uh, short scenario you need to do to uh, ultimately uh, kill the king of that particular 
floor. And the four kings are uh, of, you know, Japanese mythological origin. There is uh, uh, Byako, Suzaku, uh, uh, Ginbu, and uh, Seiryu. There we go. That's the last one. And uh, the first floor is, uh, I believe, just a normal fantasy land. Uh, the second floor is... Uh, Oh, I, you know, I actually don't really remember. Uh, but one of the floors, in a very ambitious move, uh, amongst all this kind of generic fantasy stuff, is a very clear rip on Akira, where uh, you are in futuristic Tokyo, uh, where Suzaku reigns supreme, uh, much like Samurai Jack. And you have to... Uh, uh, hunting down this piece of technology, uh, charging through Suzaku and all of his goons to uh, uh, get it to make Suzaku finally vulnerable to attack, and you fight him, and uh, or them. I, I don't think Suzaku has a gender. I don't think any of these characters have genders, but you know, gender's fake in 2021. You know, right? Uh, and it's all pretty swell and cool, and you get to the top, and who's there? God. <laughs> you literally have to fight God. And God has created uh, this whole tower, this whole fun uh, video game world, uh, and has personally created all of this strife himself uh, because he thought it'd just be uh, pretty lit and pretty cool to do. And uh, you and your nameless mercenary gang just say, hey, wait a minute, that's bad. So you just go ahead and you kill God. And uh, that's the game. It's a pretty simple game. But uh, mechanically, it's uh, it's it's extremely weird. So you know how most video games, you get the you fight the dudes, you get the experience, you level up, and there you go. Uh, see, Final Fantasy uh, Legend is not that at all because it's named by our it's a uh, it's directed by our good friend um, that guy that I mentioned before who did Final Fantasy too, uh, and humans level up by um, you know the normal way sort of by just doing things in combat, and there you go. Uh, then there are uh, mutants, uh, which I believe are called espers in later, you know, translations and such. Uh, and what they do is their leveling up is a little bit inconsistent and kind of random, and at the end of each battle, you have a certain percent chance of gaining or losing an ability. Uh, and it's very stressful, and they don't tell you, so you have to physically check yourself. And sometimes it could be something super useful, like you could just get a, a nuke, which is what early Final Fantasy games called Ultima uh, very early on. You could just get it. Or the next battle, you could just lose it. You could just get immunity to uh, physical attacks. It, it could be anything, but those are sort of kind of your mages. Uh, then you have, uh, I, b I believe, finally, your monsters. And and the monsters are basically the same as the monsters you fight in the game, except for that uh, when they drop, excuse me, when you beat a when you beat an enemy, they have a random chance of dropping meat, and eating the meat will turn you into a different monster species, and you don't really know which one you're gonna get. I mean, you could look at a big complicated chart, but in the year 1990, like people didn't know what the internet was, uh, they didn't know, so you effectively had no clue. big sip of water right then we are on to final fantasy legend 2 which is generally considered the crowning jewel of the saga games uh so this one you are uh, uh the son or daughter or you know you could be uh whatever i mean not just in terms of like gender but in terms of like your class you could be a robot you could be a mutant uh you can be another regular human and, uh, uh, you know, you know, it's pretty good. You're the child of Indiana Jones and your dad, uh, who is Indiana Jones. I don't think he's, I think his name actually might be Indy. I don't remember. Uh, takes off one day and he says, Hey, listen up, kiddo. You got to find those 99, uh, uh, fragments called the Magi. So go do it. And you do, <laughs> you set out on a big, on a big globetrotting adventure. And for the record, this game is called Saga to Hi Hoden Tetsu, or Saga to the Legendary Treasure. And the game is all based around, you know, doing all these fun adventures, finding uh, uh, the shards of the Magi. Uh, and it's actually really, really cool because uh, they, they, they aren't just nameless MacGuffins. You can equip them and uh, get all sorts of cool stat buffs and uh, the ability to use magic and all sorts of stuff. Um, 
And uh, that's that's basically the game. You go to, uh, much like the first game, uh, a ton of several different fun-themed worlds. Uh, but you, they're, they're not really named too hard. Or, um, excuse me. They're not really themed too hard because this is a Game Boy game in 1991. They can barely squeeze anything on these cartridges. So, you know. Uh, once again, uh, the level up mechanics are mostly the same. Humans are a little different in that they don't level up the normal way anymore. Um, uh, they now level up based on uh, their action in combat as well as what they have currently equipped. Uh, so, you know, that's all swell and good. So humans tend to be very pricey because they need equipment to go. Uh, espers have returned as a more conventional mage class, but are still mostly the same as last time, but a little bit more consistent, but skewed ever so slightly towards magic. Uh, same for the monsters. Uh, the monsters are about the same, but a little bit more useful. And, uh... Finally, there's the most interesting, the robot class. Uh, the robot class, is uh, all their stats are entirely based on whatever it is that they have equipped at that time. Uh, so, and it's not just the equipment itself, but the material it's made of. Uh, you may notice from, uh, from other earlier Final Fantasy games, commonly they didn't really have a uh, space to write out the entire word. Like you may see flame with a sword symbol at the bottom or, or on the side, or gold and like a little armor symbol on the side. So, you know, it's a gold armor. Um, that is, th this is the first time this is sort of mechanically more relevant, right? Uh, where, uh, Whatever the keyword is for the item, that's what material it's made of, and the robot will base its stats from that. So you can just, you know, just go ahead and give them a bunch of, you know, the cheapest version of that item possible, and wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. You got yourself a big robot. Is that appropriate to say now? I found out yesterday that's like a sex thing. Oops, didn't mean it like that. Right, and this game is generally considered... Uh, the best saga game uh, came out in 1991, so they hadn't quite nailed making a good <laughs> Game Boy game yet. So it was uh, quite a bit ahead of its time, and even though it may be a pretty janky now, it's aged surprisingly gracefully. And uh, a last more structural note before we move on to Legend 3. Uh, once again, uh, you do uh, pass through you know a series of towers yet again uh uh, but this time, uh, they are treated as sort of, I believe, pocket dimensions that are kind of layering on top of each other. So a lot of the structure is the same. Uh, but now, uh, much like Inuyasha with its Shikon jewel, uh, the Magi sort of breaks up and all these different characters uh, uh, find it. Or sometimes they're just sort of laying around or, you know, who knows. And that brings us in conflict with our heroes. Like, uh, uh, there's a guy, Apollo, who, who is a big, a big bad guy. In fact, a lot of the bad guys are all sort of Greek pantheon characters, or at least most of them are anyway. And they've all, you know, a lot of them have kind of gone power mad from having the power of the Magi. So you have to go in there and uh, just get them all back. Uh, because as turns out, if you don't get them all back, uh, the multiverse that is connected to heaven and all these other separate planes that are all very fun themed are going to blow up. So, we can't have that. That'd be bad. Uh, towards the end, you got to put all those magi, I believe, uh, back at the uh, the center of, you know, the multiverse. Uh, but, unfortunately, uh, the goddess Isis, who had the foresight to say, hmm, I don't think I should leave the, the core of the fucking multiverse unguarded, uh, made some real big robots to try to stop you. So the final battle is just the security system for um, the multiverse, which is just a bunch of big robots. Um, the Final Fantasy connection here is that a lot of the terminology that they use is the same. In fact, some of the sprites are the same. Like, they even have a war mech who's a returning... Um, Super boss from the core Final Fantasy games. A lot of the sprites are the same, the overworld sprites and stuff. And, uh, you know, you know, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Oh, also, one last cool note. Uh, uh, Odin, uh, the long-standing Final Fantasy summon, uh, he just is a dude in this game. And he, he whenever you die, uh, he says, Wow, you seem actually like a really cool dude. Uh, I'd really like to fight you one day as a big Viking boy. Uh, he's just chilling out in Valhalla. And he says, Tell you what, uh, I'll just... We'll make a deal. If you... I'll just keep bringing you back to life, and uh, one day we'll fight in glorious battle, and uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully you win, because I am a, 
I love big fights. It's, it's no fun if there's no challenge, so let's make it happen. Uh, so that's that's very cool, and when you do beat him, eventually, um, uh, you cannot just come back to life for free. Uh, so that sucks. But uh, there you go, Final Fantasy Legend 2, otherwise known as Saga 2, very good game. Then we're on to Legend 3, which is uh, a significantly less complicated game, because it's made by normal guys. Um, I believe a lot of the staff for Final Fantasy 3 came back to work on Legend 3, and it shows because they have a lot of the same sprites and stuff in common, and uh, I believe they have some of the combat mechanic stuff in common as well. Like, uh, up until this point, no Final Fantasy games, no Saga games, or anything of that sort uh, had a system for retargeting uh, an enemy uh, once you've killed. Like, you know, if you're just, like, mashing A and... Uh, uh, guy number one, you know, kills that enemy, and then guy number two, who was still targeting that guy, just misses. No more of that. Uh, that's a Final Fantasy three thing that was translated over to Saga, thank God, uh, and it's pretty cool. So the plot there is, is that a thing called the Water Entity, and a lot of the stuff in Final Fantasy Legend games feel a little bit mechanic-y, and that's, that's very interesting. Uh, but the Water Entity is flooding the world and sending a whole bunch of monsters down. Nobody wants that. It's pretty bad. We're going to get flooded real quick like. And uh and uh, uh you and the gang, uh, including a guy who seems suspiciously like Aaron from Final Fantasy 10, uh, uh they go back in time to stop this from happening. This is pretty bad. Uh and to do this, you need a thing called the Talon. Uh the Talon is a ship that is capable of crossing time and dimensions. And uh, uh, you're trying to uh, stop this big flooding because I, I think the flooding is kind of a, a sort of extra planet or excuse me, an extra dimensional flooding for whatever reason. Uh, and it seems to be flooding multiple dimensions at the same time. And it's pretty bad for everybody. So uh, you got to go in there. You got to stop it. And it uh, turns out the bad guy was God. He's been doing this. Um for reasons that relate to uh, to ancient lore, and he's he's pretty mad about this, so you gotta go in there, you gotta stop him once and for all. But uh, there you go. There's not too much, and there's nothing super crazy going on there. This time you have a set party of four characters, uh, uh, two humans and uh, two uh, mutants. Uh, the mutants uh, uh, can now turn into monsters, so they can either be your mage or your monster, depending on what you feel like doing. There's no more robot class, even though you can become a robot. That's a type of monster now. And uh, your two humans, uh, instead of becoming robots, they uh, become cyborgs. So I believe all four party members can eat meat. Because in previous games, uh, if you pick not a monster to be part of your party, um, you guys are just, you know, every once in a while you see a message saying you got meat and nothing to do with it. But that's changed, and... Um, here we are now. Uh, this one was considered the weird one because even though it was way more in common with the mainline Final Fantasy games, uh, it just wasn't... It, it was something about the pure insanity of the other two games that uh, made them very charming, so stripping out that actually stripped out a lot of appeal, and it didn't sell super well, but... Uh, Hey, in like 1999, I believe, or maybe 2001, uh, Sunsoft got the rights from Square Enix to just, you know, republish it. And if you feel like playing these games now, which you probably should, uh, if you like old games anyway, uh, uh, they put these bad boys on the Switch, so that's pretty good. Uh, they had some DS Remix, but, uh, you know, the year is 1992, not, you know, 2000 or whenever those games come out. So, let's hop on over to Final Fantasy Adventure. Uh, so, this one actually sticks out a little bit more as a not Final Fantasy game to me, but in Japan, it was literally named uh, Seiken Dentetsu Final Fantasy Gaiden, Legend of the Holy Sword Final Fantasy Gaiden, uh, which in Europe was called Mystic Quest for some reason. Uh, I... Okay, um, but for the States, we just called it Final Fantasy Adventure in 1991. Uh, this was before Link's Awakening, but in many ways, it just kind of is a Zelda game. Um, it probably has the moniker Adventure to symbolize, hey, this game isn't a turn-based RPG, and uh, this game is probably the most notable because... Um, 
this game would end up turning into the entire mana game. Uh, they would end, they would uh, after this one drop the uh, uh, Final Fantasy Gaiden subtitle and just call it the Seiken Dentetsu series. So there you go. The more you know, but uh, I will talk about games that are specifically not Final Fantasy but seem to have a lot of DNA with Final Fantasy some other day. You know, that's why I'll talk about your Chrono Triggers, your uh, Live Alives, your Parasite Eves. But today, Final Fantasy Adventure. Uh, uh, so you you are a dude uh, who has no name, but generally the fan consensus is that his name is Sumo. Uh, and I think that's because of a player's guide, uh, a literal player's guide, where the main character was named F uh, 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 Sumo, and the, the main character girl was named Fuji, and at first he seemed a little arbitrary, but then I realized, I bet someone in 1991 probably said, this is literally the first Japanese thing that comes to mind, Sumo and Fuji, and there you go. And that's how we call them that today. Right. Uh, but you're, you know, you're chilling out, you know, you're a slave, uh, you're a gladiator slave boy. And, uh, and one day, uh, you and your buddy, uh, Willie, I believe, uh, are fighting and he just dies. Uh, sorry, Will. And, uh, you know, you, you find your opening to get the hell out of there and make your escape. But before you do, uh, the Dark Lord, uh, who's just named the Dark Lord, just comes up and fucking kills you. So you fall down the waterfall and, uh, your adventure, uh, begins. Uh, the, the main thrust of this is that, um... Uh, the Dark Lord is trying to get on top of the waterfall. You guys were like maybe at its midpoint, but he's trying to use his uh, his Dark Empire to get to the top of the waterfall where the uh, uh, the Tree of Mana is. And that's presumably where the Holy Sword is. So uh, the main way to get that, to get that power of mana, is to go talk to a, a, a dude uh, named Gimma. Uh, who's a very a very big brain boy who knows the secrets, but he's old now. He knows all the secrets, and uh, uh, you do that, and you go on a big long quest fighting the Empire, much like in Star Wars. Uh, you're going place to place, uh, doing a lot of grid based Zelda combat, and uh, eventually, you know, you know, you, you meet a cool girl. Uh, you meet a whole bunch of other fun temporary party members that all have their own uh, sort of ability that they do on the screen. Uh, the girl heals you. There's a robot who just shoots laser beams. Uh, there is a dwarf character who uh, sells you items in the field. Very useful. Uh, there is um, uh, uh, the bard character who will change the overworld music. Very helpful because this game is full of, of jams. It's full of slaps. It's full of bops. Very good soundtrack. Please go check it out. Uh, uh, you got your fan favorites returning, you got, uh, your, uh, uh, your fire, thunder, and blizzard spells, just regular fire, thunder, and blizzard, but they now have different properties, uh, you've got the nuke spell returning, um, which, um, excuse me, last time I believe I said they called nuke ultima, but actually it's, a uh, flare, like, flare and nuke tend to be the same spell, and, uh, we, we just didn't, have a word for it yet, it's too many letters, and at this point, Final Fantasy already has a little bit of brand consistency, so uh, usually the ultimate thing is called Nuke at this point in the series, and the uh, the ultimate sword is, you know, when it's not the Masamune, it's the Excalibur, which is what you're trying to get. Now, you may have noticed that I pronounce that a little bit weird, Excalibur, because it's spelled X-Caliber, or sometimes just the Excal sword, so... There you go. You get that. You go up there. You fight the big monster. You you give. You really give it to the empire, and uh, uh, you get that. Uh, you get that big sword, and everything is cool once again. Uh, the game is really really fun. Uh, I don't know if it's aged gracefully, but it's very interesting to see action games before Zelda has totally found its footing, especially on the Game Boy, because this game is a big fun adventure, and uh. There you go. Uh, I got it. It got two remakes. Uh, there are two remakes of this game. Uh, one of them, uh, the first one you may know as Sword of Mana in 2003. That's been sort of rebranded and re, you know, put into the Mana games. And then there is uh, Adventures of Mana. Adventures of Mana uh, on the <laughs> Vita and Android. You know, the the systems that I 
don't really want to play. And uh, there we go. There we go. Next up is Final Fantasy Mystic Quest 1993. So Final Fantasy uh, has been doing reasonably well, like enough to where they want to keep brand consistency. But um, at this point, RPG is just a, a really rough sell in the... Excuse me. RPGs are just a really, really rough sell in the American market. Like, they do have some notoriety, like, Final Fantasy is a, a thing that people know, but they don't know it that hard. Like, they know it in the same way that Weeaboo's No Disgaea. Like, I guess it's a brand, but, you know, it's a very specific crowd of people that know what Disgaea is, you know what I mean? <sighs> Big sippy. Big sippy of water. I don't know, I don't know how much of this I'm gonna edit out. <laughs> Oops. Right, so there's Final Fantasy Mystic Quest that I think was just called Mystic Quest Legend in uh, in Europe, and in Japan, Final Fantasy USA, <laughs> and uh, this is an aggressively dumbed down version of Final Fantasy that actually has a lot more to do with Dragon Quest. Um, the sprites are extremely colorful. Um, you're a, a dude uh, whose name is uh, Mark, I think. Or maybe he doesn't have a name. I don't know. It's just like an aggressively Ben. Benjamin. There we go. That's his name. Uh, and he's climbing up the Hill of Destiny, which is literally what it's called. And uh, his whole situation is ruined by an earthquake that, that just wrecks his hometown. And he meets a, a generic and mysterious old man who, who makes him a knight and says, Benjamin, you got to get in there. You got to go to the focus tower. You got to, you see those four crystals that Final Fantasy games have? They've been, they've been goofed. They've been smacked up. They've been smackled off. They've, uh, they've totally been wrecked. Uh, the land rotting, the wind sucks, the fire not hot at all, the water stinky and bad. Go in there and and go restore light to those four crystals and beat the uh, the four they didn't call them fiends. Uh, the four I think they may have been called the vile four, <laughs> uh, uh, which are a stand in for the four fiends. Uh, so they're trying to do the Final Fantasy thing because at this point, I believe Final Fantasy V would have just came out, so they do know that they have some consistency to the Final Fantasy formula. So, uh, uh, uh Benjamin, uh, in a distinctly strange overworld, like it's not like a place you can walk around, it's just a map you kind of select areas on it. Uh, he goes to Foresta, Aquaria, Fire Town, Fi Fireberg, Fireberg, and Windia. And each one of those places has uh, one of the four crystals, earth, water, fire, and wind, obviously. And uh, and they have uh, the four fiends, the, the vile four, uh, that he must defeat. Uh, let me look up what their names are real quick. Okay, excuse me. Sorry about that unprofessional moment there. Uh, uh, when you're at Weeb Academy, you're getting what you pay for. Uh, so the four fiends are the Flamorous Rex, who is not of fire. He is of earth for whatever reason. Uh, the Ice Golem of water... Uh, the the Hydra of Fire and Pazuzu the Wind Demon, and they all have like upgraded forms to fight later in the game. There's a uh, Flamorous Rex, the Stone Golem, the Twin Headed Hydra, and and just regular Zoo. He's just going by Zoo now. You know what I mean? And uh, along the way, uh, uh, Ben's party only consists of two characters: himself and one assistant character who sort of levels up for you. Uh, there's Kaylee who helps you first. Uh, she is a a uh, a, a cute anime girl who has a big axe. Um, that seems to be her whole story. She just wants to get out of that forest, and she has a big axe. Uh, <laughs> there is a lot of very cute art uh, for all these characters, and um, it's pretty cool and not very consistent. Uh, there's uh, Phoebe, who's a knight uh, that has uh, cool claws, I guess. Um uh, there is Reuben, uh, who seems like a guy in like a, a little tiny mech suit, or maybe a big set of armor. Uh, a lot of his art, um, uh, so so for just looking at his sprites, you may just think he's a dude in, a, in a in like armor, but in like all the Japanese art, he looks more like a mech, like a man cosplaying as like a, a Gundam, you know. Well, not a Gundam because he doesn't have a V, but you know what I mean. But in the Western artwork, he's just some big brute guy. Uh, which I guess that makes enough sense because they didn't 
have any art to work with. Yeah, this is, I cannot stress enough, a game made for America. <laughs> and finally, there's Tristam, who's sort of a ninja, but the Final Fantasy ninja, where they take a lot of um, Middle Eastern elements and add it to these characters, which is uh, very cute. I'm happy that um, uh, they are represented here. Right, so uh, after all that good stuff, uh, you get up to the top and you fight the, the big bad man who, who's just, I think just called the Dark King or something. And uh, you fight him and then the day is saved, as you do in Final Fantasy games. Uh, but there's one little secret, uh, a little secret you may not know about. Uh, if you're too fucking stupid to play video games. Uh, the Dark King, being undead, is weak to cure, cure magic, which is the most effective way of killing him. Uh, you see, this game was made for an American market for people that don't like RPGs, so I guess Square Enix just kind of assumed that, you know, Americans are too fucking stupid to understand RPGs, which is, you know, based on the state of things right now, I think that's a reasonable assumption. I mean, I like them, but I can see where they're coming from. Um, so they just wanted a game to dumb down the market, and uh, I don't know if it sold very well. Uh, then there is the Chocobo games that could honestly be a video of its own, but I'm uh, I'm gonna keep it real with you. We're gonna keep it short. So 1997, there is uh, Chocobo Racing. Uh, Chocobo Racing. Oh, excuse me. That's that's actually not true. Um, there is Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon, the Fushini No Dungeon. Uh, I'm, I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, excuse me. Uh, but yeah, Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon, actually the first mystery dungeon to come out stateside. Uh, a, it's a mystery dungeon game, it's a roguelike, and that's basically it, and there's a lot of them. Uh, for those of you uninitiated with mystery dungeon games, uh, they are all randomly generated dungeons, um, where you go in there, and you fight a whole bunch of monsters on a little map, and you, you try to go deeper down, into the dungeon. It's all on a grid and it's all turn based, but not the regular turns. The turns are based off like taking an action. Like mo like moving from one square to another is a turn. But the place is big enough to where you 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 just are walking like any other Final Fantasy overworld and instead of breaking into a random battle, you can see the enemy coming closer to you using their turns to uh uh, to draw in closer and closer to you. Uh, to my understanding, most of these mystery mystery dungeon games are, are all hard. Even the Pokemon ones tend to be reasonably difficult, too. Uh, much like the Warrior games are being based on Dynasty Warriors, the mystery dungeon games mostly center from the mystery dungeon series and has seen way more success licensing themselves out to uh, various publishers, like there's Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, Chocobo Mystery Dungeon, uh, those are the only two Mystery Dungeons I can think of right now, um, and there you go. Uh, one of these seems to basically come out every single year, and maybe half of them, give or take, have actually come out stateside, and that is because a lot of them are uh, just the same game, mostly. Uh, some of them on the Wonder Swamp, which we didn't get. Many of them on the cell phone. Uh, a lot of them are very cutesy. And at this point, I don't think the Final Fantasy series had much leverage in being super cutesy, even though it kind of is by default. Uh, all of these different dungeons have tons and tons of uh, iconic Final Fantasy enemies, like, uh, you know, obviously chocobos, bombs, goblins, uh, uh, mech suits, and all that, all that other stuff. Uh, then before we get to to the big the big meaty one, you know you know where it's going. Uh, there's Chocobo Racing. Uh, you race. It's a Chocobo game. It's not it's not super good, but it's uh, fine, I guess. Uh, Chocobo Racing games. Uh, actually, Chocobo games in general uh, are very very big at bringing in all sorts of different Final Fantasy characters that. Uh, are very iconic, but don't necessarily have enough time in the limelight. Uh, like, you know, Chocobo, of course, is there. Moogles are there. Uh, but, you know, on the box art, you see, like, Black and White Mage, who are, who are both equally very important characters to Final Fantasy lore, but just aren't... They're a little bit disproportionately not represented in the main game. Like, we have Vivi, of course, but... And we have Garnet, and we have uh, Yuna, I guess, and, and Lulu, but... Mm, uh, we just don't really see too many people in that, like, iconic, uh, a big pointy hat and big triangle, you know, 
uh, uh, dress. But here we are, and this is the game that sort of um, uh, made it canonical that the white mage has uh, purple or pink hair. And the black mage is like maybe some type of gnomish figure, possibly. I interpret them as black because I need all the representation I can get. <laughs> ha ha. Uh, right. Anyway. At first I was moving in chronological order, but we're actually just going to save the best for last. So uh, before we go, uh, it's it's Final Fantasy Legend of the Crystals, an OVA anime movie. It is a full hour and 45 minutes of, of generic anime goodness. So this one is sort of based on Final Fantasy V, except for not really, it's a sequel. A sequel of dubious quality. Uh, it is my favorite, least favorite genre of sequel where uh, it, it definitely is a follow-up, but uh, it has basically nothing to do with the original. So uh, it's been, like, I don't know, hundreds of years after Final Fantasy V. After, you know, they've, they've done their thing, they've saved those crystals, they've stopped the, the big, uh, generic, angelic enemy, and uh, they got them. So now we're following uh, one of the descendants of the Light Warriors in Final Fantasy V. Uh, well, I don't think they were called the Light. I think they may have been called like the, the Dawn Warriors or something. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> we're following them on their quest to once again restore those crystals because immediately after the events of Final Fantasy V, uh, some some pretty some pretty bad dudes, some pretty bad fellows like Corn Pop and the boys, they've shown up. Uh, they they've killed Sid. Uh, which makes me very sad because Sid is my 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 namesake. It's unfortunate. Um, they kill Sid. They 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 get those crystals and they use his brain for evil. And uh, uh, you know our boys now have to go out there and uh, go stop them. It's basically another Final Fantasy affair. It's split up over four episodes. Uh, interestingly, this actually did see a release when Final Fantasy V totally did not because, uh, hey, you know, it's a short OVA. Final Fantasy has some name recognition and uh, somewhat reminds me of how Fire Emblem got an OVA, but uh, <laughs> like a deck, like, a decade before we actually saw that game come out in English. And by a decade, I mean like two decades. But you know, you know who's counting? Who's counting a couple of decades here and there, right? So uh, this has basically fuck all to do with Final Fantasy V. But um, uh, what they're doing... Oh, and it also looks nothing like Final Fantasy V either. The uh, Chocobo in it is fucking hideous. Uh, the only returning character is, is mid uh, Mid was Sid's grandson, who who is here as a ghost, and we see Bart's and the gang uh, in flashback sometimes. But this is basically a totally unrelated Final Fantasy story where they're kind of redoing their thing. You know, it can't. It got a dub in 1998, so uh, it came out right when uh, we were in peak. Please dub any short OVA so it doesn't break the bank, but we still want that anime money times. And, uh, there we go. Is there anything else interesting here? Oh, yes. Okay, so one, it's not very interesting at all. This series is, is pretty boring. Uh, it, it's pretty sparse on, uh, things. Uh, we do see some flashbacks. We see, uh, Bart and the gang, uh, uh, as ghosts. We see them as adults. So that's actually, unironically, really, really cool. Um... Uh, no Final Fantasy music, as far as I can tell. Uh, yeah, I know, that's weird, right? In fact, there just isn't really that much music, period. And I think this OVA suffers from trying to do two things at once. So it has no interest in being a Final Fantasy thing. And that's, you know, more power to him, I guess. But, um, it's struggling to be a 90s adventure anime with, like, you know, a tons and tons of panty shots and goops. Uh, but also trying to be, like, this kind of lofty, off-brand uh, Miyazaki bit, where the whole game, or the whole OVA's aesthetics, like, its whole thing, right, is basically an off-brand castle in the sky. And it honestly is kind of charming that that's the thing they went for. They definitely went for a more castle in the sky aesthetics, especially because parts of Final Fantasy uh, do seem to uh, have a certain amount of love for castle in the sky. But uh, there you go, it's that OVA. Uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, I'm sure some of you may be a little mad that I'm just telling you to watch on YouTube, but um, I don't believe this ever came out on DVD, and it looks like no one's ever going to do it. So, there you go. Square Enix seems to not give a shit if you pirate it, so. Alright. 
it's time to end on the highest note possible. Uh, truly the uh, uh, the golden grail of Final Fantasy spinoffs. The Final Fantasy spinoff that uh, uh, all spinoffs try to be, not just in Final Fantasy, but in general. We are at the end of the road for today's lecture. Final Fantasy Tactics. All right. So before I tell you about one of the dopest Final Fantasy games that has ever graced reality, let me first tell you about its backstory. So I've listed off a lot of Final Fantasy uh, spinoffs today, and a lot of them uh, aren't even necessarily super proper Final Fantasy games, but just have a lot of people working on them, and sometimes have the Final Fantasy moniker, and sometimes don't. Mm. But uh, uh, in reality, Square Enix was actually pretty reluctant to... Uh, to make a whole bunch of Final Fantasy spinoffs, or at least at this point in their history, and this was the first time with their with their whole chess, with with no um, uh, uh, if ands or buts, that so they make a true and blue Final Fantasy game, uh, kind of <laughs> in tactics, and uh, uh, they knew they wanted to do it. This this came out right around the time Final Fantasy VII came out, came out on the heels of Final Fantasy VI, so. Final Fantasy as a series was sort of in a in a big growth period where they're going from like kind of cheesy, cutesy video games to to more mm, mm, mature, dare I say, uh, more ambitious affairs. Uh, and that movement sort of started with Final Fantasy VI putting an unironic twenty minute play in the middle of the game and then having like a forty five minute like no input ending sequence. Uh, then we have Final Fantasy VII, which did everything it possibly could to make a uh, RPG just you know graspable to the general public like saying hey nerds get out of here you already got yours it's time to move into the future uh not just in terms of technology but in terms of like storytelling and all that good stuff uh final fantasy tactics uh try to do this in a different way this was a darker more mature final fantasy game and the person that we have to uh uh I was going to say blame, but the game is great. Uh, the person that we owe this to is... I forgot his name. One sec. Matsuno. That's his name. Uh, Yasumi Matsuno. Okay, you're probably noticing an audio quality change here. It's because my Uber Eats got here. Had some real horrible fast food. Right, so where were we? Matsuno. So the thing about Matsuno, right, is he is the dude behind the... Uh, Ogre Battle series, or later the Ogre Tactics series. And much like Shigesato Itoi, uh, he is the kind of guy where it's very obvious that he is drawing from a range of influences outside of video games. And his Ogre series is one that, uh, it's mechanically very different in that they are tactics games, but every unit isn't just a singular unit like, say, Fire Emblem, but generally represent a small battalion of, I think, four or five characters on a 3x3 grid, and where they are on this small grid affects what they do in combat. Like, uh, I don't know, for example, uh, a knight guy in the back row will, like, provide backup, but on the front row, you know, they're fighting or something to that effect. Uh, and a lot of his games tend to be much darker in tone. He, he, they all seem to be much more dark and immature in tone than most other JRPGs on the market. Uh, and the reason why this is relevant is because um, uh, one fine day after doing his thing on, a, on the Ogre Battle series, right? Uh, Square Enix says, Hey, bro, um, we're going to be making a Final Fantasy tactical game uh would you like to uh partake and at the time he's working with uh i believe quest and uh his games just aren't really selling super duper well and this is not that you know they're selling awfully like th th they made ogre games for like the next decade or so but um this would be like if the nba pulled you over and said hey man are you ready to uh to 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 pal around with um Michael Jordan, you ready to, to hoop it up with Shaq or, or whatever? I, I don't know what sports guys do. 
Uh, <laughs> so uh, he said, no problem, my friends. Um, and he basically made another Tactics Ogre game. But then Square Enix said, ooh, you know, well, actually, it was just Squaresoft at the time, but you know what I mean. Uh, they said, ooh, you know what, actually, could you please... Um, uh, use some more Final Fantasy mechanics, and he was like, yeah, no problem. So now there is this deep, interesting, mature, very Game of Thronesy narrative that uses Final Fantasy iconography. Uh, Tactics would actually be the beginning of a subseries uh, called the Ivalice Alliance, which is the name of the world that Tactics is set in, and also 12, and also a small handful of other Final Fantasy spinoffs, and uh, one not Final Fantasy game called Vagrant Story, which was mostly headed by the same staff. So, there you go. Uh, Matsuno himself actually called this the Zodiac Brave Story, uh, which is a much, much better name than the Ivalice Alliance, but uh, if any of you out there have any IQ points, you probably immediately knew that. Okay, you're about to notice a whole lot of audio shift because there's a lot going on for Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, I obviously can't talk about all of it. You know, I don't really spend more than a couple of minutes because you get what you pay for, people. This is the 101 class. Uh, Final Fantasy Tactics could be a class all to its own. Uh, and in many ways, it is a class all to its own because it is definitely the most well-written Final Fantasy game. Uh, not just up to this point, but just in general. Uh, Matsuno himself writes his stories not so much like a fantasy, but more like historical fiction. Uh, and he really does explore a lot of the implications behind a lot of Final Fantasy lore. Like, there are mages, sure, but, you know, is there a central organized church? Is there a kingdom with an army? If there is a kingdom, who is the king? Uh, you know what happens a lot in historical fiction and also in real life? Uh, wars over the throne, uh, which end up being extremely pointless and get a lot of people killed and end up going on for a long ass time with nothing to show for it. And guess what, people? All of this and more is here and represented in Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, like I said before, uh, this is all written like historical fiction. Uh, I believe this is all contextualized as uh, a history that has at this point been mostly lost to time, or, or at the very least, this particular perspective of history, the story of Final Fantasy Tactics and its own continuity is sort of lost to time, and this is a forbidden text that people aren't really supposed to read because history is determined uh, by the winner. And our uh, protagonist boy, Ramza, he's, he's a good dude. He does his best to be uh, the best boy possible, but... Uh, as I said before, this is a Game of Thrones world, this is a, a historical, medieval setting uh, that has more in line with that than traditional fantasy. So there's a lot of violence, a lot of subterfuge, and the idea of going out there and uh, claiming that empty throne that he's you know, trying to do for the whole game, uh, because he is of royal blood, isn't one of, like, a noble crusade across the land where you beat, like, you know, uh, General Hate and, uh, you know, his four buddies, uh, uh, General Violence, uh, General Mean Dude and Captain Cruelty or whatever, uh, like a Fire Emblem, but, uh, there's a, a deeper understanding of, um, if Ramza wants to be a good boy, he is fighting fate itself. Like, no one wants him to be a good boy. Like, the world is not cut out for good, sweet boys like him. Uh, but uh, that is sort of what makes Ramza so likable, because we have plenty of very likable, friendly protagonists, but we don't really have one in a world that is uh, very welcoming to being, like, cruel and capricious and... Uh, much like with a lot of historical fiction, if, if the thing you want to do is uh, get out there and claim that throne, you're going to have to get your hands dirty, you're going to have to do a lot of subterfuge, a lot of assassinations, and uh, there's a lot of that in Final Fantasy Tactics, let me tell you what. And because Ramza is a guy that uh, wants to be a good boy, uh, he ends up kind of losing everything. Like, he loses his fame, uh, his fortune, like, his ties to being, like, a, a big noble dude, uh, like, all that knighthood all that knighthood stuff, and generally people think he's like this big uh, uh, blaspheming fellow, like just, just a real 
bad dude because he's, he's just not willing to sink to everyone else's level. Uh, but good on him for staying uh, with the cause and doing his thing without getting his hands uh, too dirty. And unfortunately for our boy Ramza, uh, things just don't really work out for him. And he just kind of gets forgotten to history. Uh, but I've already talked about that. Uh, who is sort of the guy that would go down in history is his good buddy, uh, uh, Delita. Uh, Delita is sort of the Dark Ramza, and it looks like um, at some point when Matsuna was planning Final Fantasy Tactics, uh, he wanted a sort of chaos and law route, and uh, it just couldn't happen, so he made Ramza the law route and Delita the chaos route, or whatever, where he kind of is way more willing to get his hands dirty and do all that, you know, that really bad, messed up stuff that, uh, it's generally considered war crimes. Uh, Delita isn't a bad guy by any stretch of the word. However, in this particular type of narrative, eh, you kind of have to be a bad guy to, to do your thing. So ultimately, he is a pretty idealistic and honorable dude, but... You know, he does understand that the that the ends do justify the means, or at least that's what he thinks. So, ultimately, he does kind of become king, and uh, Ramza is once again left to history. Okay, but I've talked around the plot of Tactics for a little bit, so let's just, you know, give you the, the quick and dirty. Definitely not doing this whole thing any type of justice, and that's fine. This is a 101 class you get what you pay for. I said it enough times, people. Uh, so there's a continent with two kingdoms on it. One of it is one of them is our boys uh, in Elise, or Evelise rather, excuse me. And uh, you know they were at war for a long time, and Evelise uh, in theory uh, came to an agreement with the other kingdom, but turns out it's just basically an unconditional surrender, and all the people that fought in Evelise's war uh, were basically unpaid. Everyone's extremely angry, and then to make matters worse, uh, the king just dies. So there's like a huge, huge power vacuum here, and the throne is up for grabs because the king did not have uh, a proper heir. So there's a big war going on to figure out who's going to be the uh, the next king. And uh, there you go. And among these uh, factions, among these various factions, are uh, the church. Um, and the church... Uh, they're trying to, to, to get in there, they're trying to make themselves uh, the guys running all this stuff. Uh, but turns out, uh, the person who is at the head of this is actually being, uh, uh, is actually being possessed by a blood demon named Ultima. Uh, and Ultima seeks to uh, not just, you know, do some cool king stuff, but just, you know, basically unleash <laughs> uh, uh, the, the denizens of hell onto the public, and it's our boy Ramza's job, who's, he's trying to, um, uh, to, to take who he believes, I think, is the proper heir to the throne, and along the way, uh, on an opposite sort of journey, is his homeboy, uh, Delita, that I mentioned before, who is also on a journey trying to reclaim the throne. Uh, how this plays out, um, I was gonna say I'll leave up to you, but ultimately Delita does become king. They do stop Ultima once and for all, uh, as for Ramza, it's not super clear what happens to him after the events of the story. Uh, his name for, like, basically putting the church in a really, really tight spot. They do remain being a big power in Ivalice, but all that stuff about being, you know, under the control the whole time of, like, a blood demon, that's all erased from history. Uh, Ramza is erased, uh, th and the, the big war going down, the War of the Lions, uh, doesn't know that he was a part of it. So... That's all very unfortunate for our boy. Uh, there are uh, a few manuscripts remaining that, you know, in theory acknowledge his existence, but, uh, but that's all hidden level 10 deep lore. Uh, my running theory is that, you know, maybe someone had him assassinated. That, that seems to be just the kind of thing that tactics might do, but they definitely leave it nice and ambiguous. So if you want to believe that uh, Ramza and his remaining alive buddies just rode out into the sunset to be cool dudes out there uh, chilling out on the beach, uh, you know, you know, that's perfectly valid. And I kind of like that one a little bit more. Uh, as for our would-be King Delia... Uh, he takes one of his uh, his buddies throughout the game, uh, Oren, I believe his name was, O-R-R-A-N, not A-U-R-O-N, like the Final Fantasy X guy, uh, afterwards, right? And then uh, he just... Um uh, he just he just has the poor guy executed uh, because Oria has um, uh, made something called the uh, 
uh, the Durai papers. These are these are official documentations of what happened. And um, uh, uh, Delita said, "Oh no no no, we can't have that. We can't have that at all." So he has uh, uh, Orin uh, burned at the stake and has um, <laughs> has our boy uh, Ramza labeled a heretic, and he goes on to rule Ivalice for many many years. Uh, then, uh, he rolls up on his wife and says, hello, my beautiful wife, a uh, wonderful day we're having. And this is at, like, the very end of the game, like, several decades after this whole thing has gone down. And, uh, and his wife, you know, tries to kill him, because she's like, she's found out the truth, she knows what's up, she knows she knows too much, and she tries to, uh, uh kill him before he can kill her. But, uh, lo and behold, the, uh, bouquet of roses he was carrying the whole time had a knife, because that's, he, he was gonna... He was going to do it. He was going to kill her. Uh, he probably survives the knife attack, and uh, he, 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 keeps, he keeps doing his thing, but that is basically the end of our story, where, uh, where there we go. Where there we go. Uh, as far as the gameplay, the gameplay is fine. Uh, it's a tactics game. You know, you, you go around on, on a little grid, and you do fighting. And there you go. Uh, the thing that makes Tactics special is that it borrows the uh, system from Final Fantasy V, where you get AP, or ability points, from uh, enemies you defeat that can be invested into a number of different fun and interesting classes. Uh, one of which uh, is the Calculator. Uh, I only bring that up because I like that it's called the Calculator. Uh, among them we have um, several, several different... Uh, classic Final Fantasy archetypes: uh, the Black Mage, the White Mage, the Soldier, the Knight, uh, the the um, uh, the Monk, the Thief. Uh, the, all those boys—they're all here. They're all back. And uh, according to the official art, they all have incredibly big gloves. Uh, for whatever reason, the artist that works on Tactics is very good at drawing very cute faces, and also draws these like ridiculous, ridiculous huge hands and. You know, you know, as much as I love this game, as much as I think this is something truly special, I cannot say I've ever really cared much for the visuals of Final Fantasy Tactics. But, uh, you know, you know, I respect what it did, and it's really a shame that Square Enix would, or Square would never really come back to it. Uh, now, make no mistake, there are other Tactics games, but they basically have nothing to do with this whole, uh, big medieval fairy, t or, uh, this, this big, um... A historical fiction-like setting with a Final Fantasy skin plastered over it. Uh, I believe he did sort of direct Tactics Advance, but he was pretty hands-off with that one, and it's pretty clear he had nothing to do with it, really. And uh, he did begin directing 12, but 12 was a mess that ended up changing directorial hands several times over its development, ending on the guy who directed Final Fantasy II and Saga. So we've gone full circle, people. And that's why Final Fantasy XII is a mess and obviously made by a weird guy. Uh, as we discussed at the beginning, we're only going to be going up to 2000, uh, which basically brings us to uh, where we're going to end the episode for today. So, uh, if we ever get around doing, the, doing a part two, uh, you'll be very pleased to know uh, unfortunately for me, that means I'm going to have to do my own due research on Final Fantasy Spirits Within and Final Fantasy Unlimited, which are both bad, and also the next two spinoffs that come out. Now, uh, if you're like me, an aggressively American, locked inside, eating your comfort hamburgers and Coca-Cola, um... Uh, uh, you may be thinking, hey, what about Final Fantasy Anthology? Uh, what about uh, Final Fantasy, um, that other one? What about Final Fantasy Origins? What about those two? Uh, or whatever the PS1 version of Origins were called. Uh, well, you see here, folks, that one was a, a re-release of Final Fantasy 1, 2, and 5. The first time those games have ever came over here, so I, don't, I think it may be beyond the uh, uh, scope of discussion for this conversation, but I will keep it short and say they did add some uh, some very aggressively badly aged um, 3D cutscenes that are uh, very charming and very hideous, and um, that pretty much brings us up to date Well, with the year 2000. So if there's a Final Fantasy Guide in uh, uh, 101 or a uh, Weeb Academy or whatever the hell I'm going to call this lecture, uh, uh, make sure you like the video and subscribe it.
and um you know you know what to do i'm on twitter manga dungeon at twitter.com there's gonna be more of this probably and uh, uh you may all be interested to know what's happening next uh, if you ever do a uh, a a 101b <laughs> there we go that's a, yeah a 101b uh a class on final fantasy spinoffs you will be uh delighted to know that next up is final fantasy the movie spirits within <laughs> And Final Fantasy Unlimited, which is uh, an anime series. They're both anime. So uh, those are pretty bad. So look forward to my suffering. Okay, I, I've been uh, Professor Sydney. So get out of here and uh, make sure you, you watch it three times. Because this is going to be on the test. And the test is life, people. Okay? The test is life. <laughs>